It is now my honor to introduce our keynote speaker for this commencement. Our keynote speaker is a statesman, former congressman, radio and television commentator, educator, activist, orator, author, and consultant. The Honorable Kwaizi Mfume, an active leader in the civil rights struggle for many decades, is the former president, CEO of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, as well as a five-term Democratic congressman from Maryland's 7th Congressional District. While earning his undergraduate degree, graduating magna cum laude at Morgan State University in Maryland, he grew interested in politics, becoming head of the Black Student Union and editor of the school newspaper. After graduation in 1976, he enrolled at John Hopkins University to earn his master's degree in liberal arts and thereafter served on the Baltimore City Council from 1979 to 1986. During his seven years of service in local government, this conquering son of kings, as is the translation of his name, led efforts to diversify city government, improve community safety, enhance business development, and divest city funds from the then apartheid government of South Africa. In 1986, he became a candidate for Congress for the 7th District, a position which he was to hold for the next five terms. While in his third term, he was chosen by the Speaker of the House to serve on the Ethics Committee and the Joint Economics Committee of the House and Senate, where he was later elected chairman. Congressman Nfume consistently advocated landmark business and civil rights legislation. He served as both vice chair and later chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus. He was regularly designated to serve as speaker pro tem of the House of Representatives and during his fifth term in office was appointed by the Congressional Democratic Caucus as vice chairman for communication. His congressional uh, seat, to, he left his congressional seat to become president and chief executive officer of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in February of 1996, after being unanimously elected to the post and serving for nine years. During his tenure as CEO, he significantly raised the national profile of the NAACP while helping to restore its prominence among the nation's civil rights organization. In 2003, he helped negotiate for and successfully secured the NAACP's official United Nations status as a non-governmental organization within that world's body and with all of the rights and privilege thereto and pertaining. Appointed by the Secretary of Health and Human Services, he currently sits on the National Advisory Council on Minority Health and Health Disparities at the National Institute of Health. He is presently a member of the Gamma Boule Sigma Phi, Phi Fraternity and Order of the Prince Hall Masons, the Morgan State University Board of Regents, where he recently was elected as chair, the Board of Research America, the National Advisory Council of Boy Scouts of America, the American Society of Association Executives, and the Association of Former Members of Congress. <coughs> Excuse me. The Honorable Kawizi Nfumi is the recipient of 10 honorary doctorate degrees, the NAACP Image Award, and the 2005 Telly Award for the television documentary, Ticket to Freedom. His former best-selling autobiography, 
published by Ballantyne's book, is entitled, No Free Ride. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in extending a warm UVI welcome to our keynote speaker, the Honorable Kwaizi Nfumi, as he comes forward to inspire our graduates and all of us. Thank you very much, President and Dr. David Hall. Thank you for your leadership of this community, your stewardship of this great university, and what I hope will be a lasting friendship into the many, many years yet to come. You are, sir, a stalwart in the storm, one who has stood steady and steadfast through it all. And no matter how long the journey, cold, the chill, fierce, the enemy, or few the friends, you found a way to capture these students' will to dare to be different, and in the process to dare to make a difference. You are a voice against violence and a voice for reason, and this nation, and indeed these territories, are better served because of your presence. I salute you, all the members of the Governance Board of Trustees who day in and day out, as a labor of love, assist in the governance of this institution. My thanks to the Lieutenant Governor for his presence here this evening. Uh, my thanks also to an old and dear friend, and I say that lovingly, your Congresswoman and Delegate, Dr. Donna Christensen, who I continue to turn to for guidance, and who's worked with me and I with her for many, many years. Senate President Malone, you've been introduced, but I would be remiss if I did not also deliberately redundant lift your name and the name of all of the senators, some of whom I met earlier today, that really do the heavy lifting in the legislature. And now if you would just abide me for another second, I want to also say to these distinguished deans of this institution, uh, perhaps I should refer to you as the president did earlier as the guardians of academic excellence. We appreciate all that you do. We appreciate the faculty, the alumni, the parents who are here, the grandparents who are here, and most of all, the graduating class of 2013. Dr. Hall, the light burns bright for the University of the Virgin Islands because it represents both a place and a purpose that have allowed over these last 50 plus years dreams to be born and to come true and then to give birth to other dreams of service and academic excellence. And you've done that in a way that has caught the eye and the attention of so, so many others. And you do it at an interesting time, a time of great challenge because of technology and the world that we are in. We're living at a time when we're able now to communicate, as many of your students will attest to, across continents, across oceans, across every conceivable boundary of race and culture, and to do that almost instantaneously as a result of that technology. But that technology has also made it possible for us, in some instances, to work and to live in complete isolation from our fellow citizens and sometimes our own neighbors. The common experiences that have made us recognize each other as members of a community of Americans, in some respects, are becoming less clear. Scab labor, unbridled poverty, second-class citizenship, and violent crime all chip away at that sense of community that many of us took for granted when we were younger. Hate speech, hate groups, hate radio, and hate crimes are attempting to divide those communities as never before. 
And yet we know that if we lose sense of that community, the one that Martin Luther King spoke about from an old Birmingham jail, then we will lose much of what has made America distinctive among the nations of the world, for our strength has always been our identity as a group and a collection of different people whose common destiny was always more powerful than our diverse stations in life. But like you and many other young people who watch what we do, who are not graduating today, they continue to have questions about where we are and how we got there and where do we go from here, things that we don't always have a lot of answers for. And we sit and we work and we think and we try to reason and come up with a way that we ourselves, in and of what we do, can make a real and lasting difference. Sometimes we are successful, and other times we are not. But what is interesting is how people of those diverse backgrounds believe in the unbelievable, and how our foreparents, long before they had what we take for granted today, made their bodies bridges that we could ultimately run across and get to the university and contribute to the society and eventually help to lead the world. And there are many of you who sit here today who are mature students, and Ms. George, I tip my hat to you. And those who are not yet mature, but who are maturing as young people, who wonder what this world is going to do when you step off of this stage and into it. And you wonder how you're going to be accepted, and you wonder if people will listen. But let me tell you this. Without you, we are, in fact, lost. And so unlike you, there are too many of other young people your age today who are not graduating. They are not in college. They are not in the military. They're not in trade schools. And they're not looking forward to what tomorrow holds. For them, they are fighting just to survive the streets of this city and other cities. And unlike you, they are not in control of their destiny. Too many of them are dealing with the primary in a way that does not give real credence to the things that we, we consider to be important. So instead of the real primary, they're actually dealing with the secondary, believing it to be the primary. Too many of them are dealing with the tangential rather than the main, the fringe rather than the fact. In other words, and students, you know this better than I do, too many are still majoring in a minor. And they desperately wish, desperately, that they could sit in the seats that you sit in this evening. Because like you, many of them just want a chance. They want an opportunity to make the most of their lives. And yet meanwhile, as you will soon discover, the world, almost in a parallel universe, is loaded with those who will encourage you and those other persons to believe that these are the days to be adventuresome and exploratory and carefree. Instead of being honest and telling people your age and others that these are really the days to be qualified and informed and excellent. So you see, the great enemy of the truth, as those my age will tell you, is very often not just the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest as it is, but rather the great enemy of truth very often times is the myth, the innuendo, the suggestion, the accusation, all of which are persistent, pervasive, unrealistic, and ultimately unrelenting. And so we find ourselves too often times listening to things that cause us to doubt our own capabilities. Too often we're told that we should hold fast to the conclusions of other people. Then we begin to subject facts to a prefabricated set of interpretations, and ultimately we enjoy the comfort of opinion 
without the discomfort of thought. And yet you know, and I know, that we spent 5,000 years as a race of human beings trying to drag ourselves out of the primeval slime by searching for truth and moral absolutes. And yet you will discover, students, that in its purest form, truth is not a polite tap on the shoulder. It is instead a howling reproach. And what Moses brought down from Mount Sinai was not the 10 suggestions, but rather a blueprint for life. So students, as you go forward from this special day, one that you will keep in your heart and your mind forever, don't be stymied by the agony of failure, and don't be deceived by the ecstasy of success, because both can be illusions that vanish with the setting of the sun. Instead, I've come here today to ask and to challenge you to let your failures become your springboards and let them spring you toward greater achievement. Let your successes render you sober so they can sustain you through the torment of howling winds, the winds that you will face in life that will chill you with cold reminders of the societal challenges that you as graduates now must confront. And understand, the only place that success comes before work is in the dictionary. And don't ever forget, if you win the rat race, you're still a rat. And then learn, as I had to do, that commencement speeches don't have to be eternal to be unforgettable. You can applaud. <laughs> so I conclude as I began in great admiration of this graduating class and all that your future pretends. A couple of quick things and I will go to my seat. Number one. The degree that you will see in just a few moments will represent many things. It will be a reward for your academic excellence. It will be a reminder of a debt that you will never be able to repay your parents and grandparents. It will be both a source of relief and respect from your professors. But more than anything, graduates, more than anything, it is, in fact, a license to learn. And so age has given me the arrogance, and experience has given me the urgency to tell you what life looks like from my side of the river. My generation was the first to think, students, that we might not have any time at all. And your generation is the first to be born knowing it. In a few minutes, then, you will walk out of here with one thing that no one else has. You will walk out of here with custody. There will be thousands of people out there who will have your same degree. We grant that. There will be thousands more doing what you want to do for a living. But you will be the only person alive who has sole custody of your life your particular life, and for your entire life. Not just for the life of your mind, but also the life of your heart, what you believe in, what you are passionate about, and most of all, the life of your soul. So never let your place be with the timid. Never lose, graduates, the spirit that fired your first desire to want to learn, even back then when you were once a child. Never fear to risk your political or your professional lives in the service of those causes that fate has sent you to champion and to win. I challenge you to go forth from this place, emboldened with a new carriage, fired by a new idealism, and tempered by a new wisdom, to do the work that God and the people of this nation have called on you to do as our best and as our brightest, and then dare to move forward in new directions, into a new world and into a future where men and women 
shall have learned to live by freedom and not by compulsion. Members of the class of 2013, the promise of America is real. This land is your land. Prepare, pursue, perform, and you will prevail. Good luck, congratulations to you all, and Godspeed.